Welcome to the video world of Little League Baseball. Youngsters playing baseball are a familiar sight the world over. The Little League program makes an important contribution to the game, promoting values that go beyond winning and losing and encouraging family involvement. Little League's official How to Play Baseball by Video is a valuable aid to coaches and parents teaching children the proper way to play baseball and an essential resource for youngsters desiring to excel. I would like you to join now reciting the Little League Pledge, words that give extra meaning to the way we play. I trust in God, I love my country, and will respect its laws. I will play fair and strive to win, but win or lose, I will always do my best. Matthew, want to ride to practice? Nah, my dad's taking me. Looks like we're going to be TV stars. Yeah, do you know, what's this thing for? It's for kids. We're going to teach them how to play baseball from the beginning and up. They're supposed to learn how to play baseball by watching TV? No way. I didn't think so. But I guess if we show them the right way to do things, yeah, then they won't do the same stupid stuff we did when we were kids. So they'll still have to practice? Yeah, sure, they'll have to practice. OK, well, I'll see you later. All right, I'll see you. Bye, Rusty. Look at him, Rusty. We're going to go to practice, okay? For a little while. See you later, Frank. Take it easy. This video was designed to teach the fundamentals of playing baseball to young and beginning players. The video will also help more experienced players improve their game by showing them the right way to do all baseball skills. You won't learn how to play baseball if you just watch the video. But we'll show you the right way to hit, throw, and catch a baseball. If you practice these skills as they're shown, not only will you learn to play, but you can learn to be good. The first thing to do is to watch the video all the way through. Next, decide what skills you need help with. If you need help with a lot of skills, start with gripping the baseball and work your way through the video section by section. Each section builds on the ones that come before it, so make sure you practice and understood each skill before you move on to the next. Follow along with the descriptions and imitate the demonstrations, practicing each skill as you watch. The on-screen index numbers will help you find the skill you're working on quickly and easily. By using the numbers, advanced players will solve problems they're having, while beginning players will be led through the steps necessary to learn the skill completely. At least once, but as often as you can, have someone watch along with you and have them compare what you're doing along with what's on the screen in the demonstration. You'll have to watch each segment a lot of times to absorb all the stuff you need to master the skill. You should also watch the video before your team practices so the information is fresh as you play. The demonstrations on the tape are sometimes by lefties, most of the time by righties. If the demonstration you are watching shows someone who bats or throws with a different hand than yours, set up a mirror opposite of the TV. You can follow along by watching in the mirror. Be patient. Don't get frustrated. Even with the video, a good coach and a lot of practice. It takes time and effort to become a good, well-rounded ball player. But I think you'll agree with us that the effort was worth it. There are 19 chapters in Little League's official How to Play Baseball. You may wish to index them to your own video cassette recorder's counter. To do this, insert the cassette into your machine. Zero the counter at the end of the Chapter 1 title, Baseball Equipment, when Colin says start now. As you play the cassette through, 
make a note of the counter number at the end of each chapter title. Whenever you use the cassette after that, zero the counter when Colin says start now, and you can accurately fast forward to whichever segment you wish to find. When played at normal speed, each chapter title is 16 seconds. This will seem long to you, but was done purposefully to help you find the chapter heading you want when you're fast forward searching through the cassette. Start now? Go ahead, Colin. My name's Colin. I'm the catcher on this team. They wanted me to tell you about the equipment the team uses, because as the catcher, I wear the most equipment. That's because the catcher has the hardest job. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Are you serious? First of all, I wear a face mask. It's very important you make sure it straps on snugly. Otherwise, the mask can slip down or fall off and it won't do you any good. The chest protector is important because on throws into the dirt and also on foul tips, the ball can fly right back and hit your chest. When it hits the protector, you can hardly feel it. The same is true with my shin guards and my cup, just like this one, which I slide to my athletic supporter. Finally, the catcher has a glove, which is big and heavily padded. One other fielder has a special glove. That's the first baseman. He usually uses a long scoop-like mitt that helps him dig wild throws out of the dirt. The rest of the team wears fielder's gloves. When you buy a fielder's glove, be certain that it fits your hand. If it's too big, even if you get your glove on the ball, it will fall out because you can't squeeze it. On to the bats. As a batter, you should use the bat you feel most comfortable with. They come in all weights and sizes, and there isn't any formula for what's right, except to use the one you can swing easily, without extra effort. Also, the batter always wears a helmet, one that fits snugly and doesn't fly off when he swings. The helmet also has an ear flap to protect your temple and to keep the ball from messing up my nice features. Nice, nice. 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 Take a Nice features. But remember, the helmet is there to protect you and you should always wear it when you're bad. And you should wear it when you're running the bases too. Okay, that's it for the equipment, right? Yep, very good, right. Colin. Right, right. The cassette is designed to teach you step by step all the skills you need to play baseball. If you are a beginner or haven't mastered any of the skills, start at the beginning of the tape and learn each skill before moving on to the next. Although baseball is one of the safest activities for young people, you little league players should have a complete physical before the season starts. The physical will assure that you are in peak health and help you avoid injuries that can keep you from playing. And now Coach Ron will take you through some warm-ups. Start all your practices, even when you're working on your own, with these stretching exercises. They are easy to do and will help keep your muscles and body loose. You won't be injury-prone if you warm up properly. One, three, one, four, one, five, one, six, one, seven, one, eight, one, nine, one, ten. One, two, three, four, Five, six, back. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. In front. One, two, three, four, five, six. Left arm. One, two, three, four, five, six. And in front. One, two, three, four, five, six. We should all be warmed up and stretched out now. You guys are young enough where just a little warm up does the trick. The older you get, the more you have to do. The important thing is that you loosen the muscles and get the blood to flow. This will help keep you from pulling your muscles and other injuries. And while it's important you warm up, don't overdo it. Save your energy for practicing and playing baseball. If you do become tired, rest for a bit. 
Playing when you're tired will increase the chances that you will hurt yourself, and nobody wants that to happen. Having a strong wrist and forearm is important for playing baseball. I carry a tennis ball with me at all times and squeeze it in the palm of my hand to strengthen these muscles. It's quiet, hardly noticeable, and you can do it while walking around, watching TV, almost anywhere, except my mom says not while I'm eating. Each of the chapters is broken down into parts, marked by a small number in the corner of the screen. To learn any of the skills fully, watch the segment all the way through, then go back to the beginning and learn each part using the numbers to guide you. Okay, guys, coach is going to run you through the drill. Carrie is going to help demonstrate gripping the baseball. Think you can handle that, Carrie? Let's start at the beginning. In the beginning, there was the baseball. Rounds, of course, with seams that are wide and narrow at different spots. Carrie, the first thing you need to know is that you should grip the ball exactly the same way every time you're going to throw it. So let me use your hand to demonstrate the proper grip. First, put your index and middle fingers across the wide seams and hold the ball with your thumb directly underneath. Your ring finger and pinky should rest on the side of the ball. And the ball should be close to your fingertips so that you can see a space between the palm of your hand and the ball. And finally, there should be a space between your index and middle fingers of about the width of another finger. Don't try and crush the ball. Keep your hand relaxed. That should be your grip every time you throw the ball. It seems more complicated than it really is. It is complicated. The first time you grip the baseball correctly, you have to think about each element of the grip, where each finger goes, how much space to allow. But once you practice it a little bit, the proper grip becomes more natural. And eventually, you'll get to the point where you won't have to think at all about the proper grip. You'll just do it. Just like when you grip the ball, when you throw the ball, you want to do the same things every time. The way to develop your skills is to practice them over and over. When I first started playing, I thought I'd never throw the ball straight. Then one day, it just all fell into place. I still practice, but I don't ever think about how to do it. That's because you have the mechanics down. When you make a bad throw, you can probably feel it before you even let go of the ball. Yeah, I want to stop and start over. It's too bad you can't. Let's demonstrate the proper way to throw the baseball. Start with the ball in your glove, because you usually throw after you catch. First, get your grip on the ball and bring the glove, your hand, and the ball toward your waist. Good. As you shift your shoulder around so it points where you want to throw the ball, bring the ball backward with your palm facing down toward the ground. Keep your eye on the target. Step toward the target and make a circle with your hand around your shoulder, keeping your elbow higher than your shoulder. Let the ball go with a strong wrist snap and follow through by bringing your back foot forward and your hand and body around so that you're facing the target squarely. And if all goes well, you nab the guy at the plate. Right. Okay, let's see that again. Of course, throwing the ball is only half of it. When the ball is thrown, someone has to catch it. The first thing you want to know about catching the ball is the glove. Baseball gloves today are huge, especially compared to gloves of yesterday, like this one. Fielders in 1936, when this glove was used, made a lot more errors than players do today. You won't be using a glove like this, but with your small hands, you'll make fewer errors with a glove that fits properly. Bobby, come here. Notice when Bobby slides his fingers into his glove, they go in easily and rest there. He doesn't have to jam them in. And he doesn't have so much room they can move around inside. 
His fingers comfortably control the fingers of the glove, and the heel of his hand stays just outside. This is the way your glove should fit. If it feels more comfortable, it's okay to keep your index finger outside the back of the glove. One other important tip, always keep your hand cupped so the glove is away from the palm of your hand. If your hand is pressed close to the glove, when you catch the ball, it'll be like you're not wearing a glove at all, and it will hurt. So keep your hand cupped. Mark, throw the ball to Bobby. Good, good. Now let's take a look at what Bobby did to catch the ball. It's not as simple as it looks. First, he's positioned comfortably with his feet spread about shoulder width apart and his knees bent. His glove and his throwing hands are extended in front of him with his glove hand turned sideways so it can move up or down easily. He's ready before the ball gets to him. He keeps his eye on the ball all the way into the glove. As the ball hits his glove, he covers it with his throwing hand, bends his elbows and brings his hands and the ball back toward his body to cushion the impact. He quickly gets the proper grip and is ready to throw the ball. A special tip, if the ball is below your waist, catch it with the glove fingers pointed down. Above your waist, the glove fingers should be up. Bobby, anything you want to add? Yeah, the thing you young players should remember are, one, always keep your eye on the ball, and two, bring your hands back when you make a catch to absorb the shock. Don't stab at the ball or swipe at it. <laughs> you sound like an old pro. I dropped a <laughs> lot of throws. <laughs> well, not so many anymore. Practice has paid off. Mark, give us a pop-up. Fly balls and pop-ups are just like playing catch. You do all the same things. You should also keep your throwing foot back a little behind your glove foot. Catch with both hands if you can, just over your forehead and bring the ball down to your shoulder, both to absorb the shock and so you can make your throw with as little extra effort as you can. You may find it helpful to write down on a piece of paper, step by step, what you have to do to perform the skill correctly. Let's start with a special tip. Before anything else, you have to hold the bat the right way. Your bat shouldn't be too heavy. You should be able to swing it without too much effort. You can tell if your bat is too heavy by holding it straight out with your arms straight like this. If you can hold it like this for a few seconds, your bat isn't too heavy. Once you found the right bat, you're ready to get a good grip on it. Wrap your bottom hand, that's the one facing the pitcher as you stand on the plate, around the bottom of the bat. Your fingers go in front of the bat. Now bring your top hand up from underneath and wrap your fingers around the bat in the opposite direction. Hold the bat firmly, but don't tense up. Be relaxed and comfortable when you grip the bat and you're ready to hit. How do you learn how to hit, Bobby? Oh, my brother showed me how to stand and swing and all, but my mother says I was grabbing things and swinging when I was a baby. She says I should have been born with a bat in my hands. <laughs> so the hitting was easy once your brother showed you how? No way. I practiced a lot. I still do, because it's the hardest thing to do, because you can hit the ball right on the button, and some guy will still catch it. Still, it's better to hit the ball hard. Bobby, step up to the plate. To hit the ball hard, you have to have the right mechanics, starting with your stance. You want to have the same stance every time you hit. First, step into the batter's box and set your back foot parallel with the back line. Set your front foot forward a little in front of your shoulder. Your weight should be on the balls of both your feet and your knees bent. Your front shoulder should point right at the pitcher, and your upper body should be tilted forward a little. Turn your head so you're looking at the pitcher with both eyes over your shoulder. Your head should be straight, not tilted. If you're not seeing the pitcher with both eyes, your front shoulder is turned too much, pointed at the pitcher. You already have the bat in your hands. Bring it up just above and behind your back shoulder with your elbows down, pointed at the ground. Tilt the bat back and over your shoulder a little and keep alert, but not tense. Don't flex your muscles or lock your elbows and knees. Be loose. You're now ready to hit. Are you comfortable, Bobby? Sure, coach. I could stand like this all day. <laughs> you look natural. That's good. After you're in your stance, you're going to hit the ball by striding and swinging. We're going to use a tee to show how these work. A tee is a good way to practice your hitting. Some of the best hitters in the bigs use one, both because you don't need a pitcher to get your licks in and because you can concentrate on your mechanics, on doing everything right rather than whether the pitch is a ball or strike. Most batting tees are made so the tee is right in the middle of the plate. Slide the whole thing forward so the ball is just in front of the plate. That's where you want to hit the ball. Bobby. 
give it a swing. Not terrible, but you shifted your weight forward too soon in your stride. You lost power and control of the bat. Now take a smaller step and keep your weight on your back foot until you swing. Much better. That's good adjustment. Now let's look at what you did. Your stance is good. Back foot in line with the back of the batter's box. Feet wider than shoulder width apart. Weight on the balls of your feet and evenly distributed. Your knees are bent. Shoulder points toward the pitcher with your upper body tilted a little forward. Both eyes are on the pitcher. The bat's up, pointed back above the shoulder and elbows are pointed down to the ground. You look comfortable. You're set as the pitcher winds up. Stride forward and shift your weight backwards, putting your weight on the ball of your back foot. Step forward about six inches with your front foot and point it toward the field between the first and second baseman. As you do this, cock your hands by turning your shoulder in slightly. Don't raise or lower your hands when you do this. Move straight back. Now your hands, hips, and the bat are ready to move forward and hit the ball. When you decide to swing at the pitch, bring your hands forward toward the plate. The bat will come with your hands. As the bat comes to the plate, shift your weight forward to your front foot. Your whole body will rotate so you face the pitcher. Turn and push from your back foot. It should twist and point out toward the field as you swing. Your hips should rotate along right with your hands. The bat has to move with your hips, almost as if they were connected. Watch the ball all the way in. Even though you can't see the ball hit the bat, you have to try. Keep your eye on the ball. Through your swing, your head should be still. Any movement will mess up everything else you do. As your hands reach the plate, throw them at the ball. The bat will swing into the ball in front of the plate. Your bottom hand is facing down, your top hand facing up as you make contact. Follow through by swinging into, not at the ball, and bring the bat all the way around with your bottom hand. Ted Williams, the last big leaguer to hit 400 in a season, says that hitting is the most difficult skill in all of sport. You've just seen the proper way to do it. If you learn these mechanics and use them the same way every time you hit, you'll be halfway to being a good hitter. The only way to get the rest of the way is to practice, practice, practice. Only by swinging over and over at a ball on a tee and one pitch by a pitcher will you become a hitter. Another hitting skill that requires a lot of practice is bunning. The effort is worth it because the difference in many games is just one run. And many times that one run comes when one team advances a runner with a bunt. Bobby, come over here and explain the sacrifice bunt. We'll use a pivot method. Using the pivot method, I set myself in my regular batting stance. As the pitcher winds up, I pivot around on the balls of my feet, like this, so my toes on both feet are pointed at the pitcher. I make sure to keep my weight forward and my knees bent. I slide my top hand halfway up the barrel of the bat and I hold it firmly in my fingers out in front of the plate. I keep my head low and look just over the bat, which I hold right at the top of the strike zone. I keep my eyes on the ball and watch it until it hits the bat. If the pitch is above the bat, I know it's a ball and I don't punt. I try to catch the ball with the bat. On low pitches, I bend my knees and bring my whole body down with the bat to the level of the ball. So I'm always looking at the ball right over the bat. And of course you want to hit the top of the ball with the bottom of the bat. Yeah, a pop-up on a bun is almost always a double fly. Okay, Bobby, show us how it's done. Right down the pipe, Justin. Good. You should never bun a pitch that's out of the strike zone. Groove it, Justin. Great fun, great fun. It's beautiful to see it done right. Even after you've mastered a skill, go back to the tape and review it. Reviewing, like practicing, will keep you clear on what you have to do. Good slide, Willie. Let's take a look and see how you did that straight in slide. 
the steel was on, so you're ready to run as soon as the ball passes the batter. Keep your left foot against the bag with your weight on the balls of your feet. You know you're going to run and slide before the play starts. Of course, if the ball is hit in the air, you'll have to return to first. The pitcher throws the ball. It passes the batter. He hasn't swung. Take a crossover step and run at full speed towards second. Don't look to see if the catcher is throwing the ball because that will slow you down. You're going to slide. About 10 feet before the base, take off. You can take off with either foot, but almost everyone finds it more comfortable to take off from the foot opposite the hand they throw with. You take off from your left leg by striding, then tucking it underneath your other leg. Slide on your backside in the upper part of your bent leg. Keep your head and shoulders up and watch the base all the way in. Slide straight into the base and keep your hands up off the ground so you don't cut them. Sliding is nothing more than falling to the ground while running, but you must fall under control. It is the fastest way to get to the base and it keeps you from overrunning. The best way to learn how to slide is to start in the outfield or on any grass when it's a little wet. This helps cushion your fall and helps you learn not to jump in the air when you slide. Also, it's best if you don't wear shoes when you first start sliding. Once you're confident, move on to a baseball diamond and keep practicing. Good confident sliding will make you a much better base runner. Baseball is a team game. You need your teammates to play the game, and you need their cooperation if you're going to win. You know, players make the big leagues because they can hit, field, and run better than anyone else, but they also have to know baseball. They excel in a team situation. They know how to help their team. Part of teamwork is encouraging your teammates. When you hit a home run or make a great defensive play, you'll be sitting on top of the world. And when you make an error that costs the run or, or the game, You'll sink so low, you'll feel terrible. At one time or another, both those things will happen to you. Your teammates will like it if you don't brag when things go good and you don't cry when things go bad. Go out and play your best all the time. That's all that matters. But if a teammate does do something great, let him know you appreciate it. If he messes something up, encourage him. Remind him the next time he'll make the play. Your teammate will appreciate you looking out for him and will do the same for you. Now we're going to cover the defensive positions. Pay attention, because even if you play right field, at some point in a game, you're going to need to know what the catcher is going to do. Also, you might get the chance to play another position, and you will be at an advantage if you already know how. It's to the advantage of all of us to know all the positions and play like a team. Let's be interested in each other, whatever we do. Let's go! go! You outfielders have to cover a lot of ground. Let's start with positioning. Frank, why do you think you play right field? Because you tell me to. <laughs> Very funny, <laughs> but why? Well, because you think I have the strongest arm. That's right, and the most accurate, too. The throw from right field is the longest an outfielder has to make, so the player with the strongest arm plays right field. Sal, why do you think you play center? Because you tell me to. Uh, no, no, because I'm the fastest, and the center fielder has to run the most. I know why I play left field. Why is that? Because I hit the best. Well, that keeps you in the lineup, but it's also because you're left-handed. Left-handers have an easier time making catches on balls hit down the line. Okay, guys, why don't you explain the stance all outfielders use? You have to be in a relaxed, balanced position, ready to move forward or backward to the left or the right on every hit. Your feet should be about shoulder width apart with your throwing hand foot back. Bend your knees and lean forward a little. Your hands are relaxed in front of you, ready to feel the ball. As the pitcher winds up, Rock forward onto the balls of your feet and bring your hands out in front. You're set. That's excellent, fellas. So, let's take a look at a catch you made this morning. You're in your stance, so you're ready to run in any direction. When the ball hits the bat, 
right away you should be able to tell if it's to your right or left. Keep your eyes on the ball. Run to a spot that is a step or so behind where the ball is going to come down. Then step into the ball as you catch it. Don't forget, run on the balls of your feet. If you run on your heels, your eyes bounce, and it's impossible to keep your eye on the ball when it looks like it's bouncing. As the ball comes down, put your glove in front of your forehead. Watch the ball over the top of it. Have your throwing hand up next to the glove. As the ball comes to the glove, step forward and put your throwing hand over the ball, both to make sure it doesn't pop out and to help get a grip on the ball and make your throw quickly. Also, bring the glove back to cushion the impact. When you step toward the ball as you catch it, you've already started your wind-up on the throw. You can then just grip the ball, crow hop, and fire it in. You better explain that crow hop thing or else you'll have kids flapping around like birds out here. <laughs> now, come on. The crow hop is just a, a little step and hop you take as you bring the ball back into the throwing position. Now, it gives you momentum on the throw if you hop toward where you're throwing. Let's show how you guys feel grounders. If no one's on base before the batter gets his hit, charge the ball and field it like an infielder. Put your glove on the ground with your throwing hand on top. Keep your backside low and your legs a little more than shoulder width apart. Feel the ball like a shortstop. The other way to do it is to charge the ball, then drop to one knee. Put the knee on your throwing hand side in front of the ball and scoop the ball with your glove as it comes to you. It's important on all grounders to keep your shoulders square to the ball. So if it takes a wild hop, it bounces off in front of you. Be sure to block the ball. If there is a runner on base, you have to be ready to throw the ball quickly after you feel the grounder. So charge the ball and put your glove down on the ground in front of your glove foot to feel the ball. If you're right-handed, that's your left foot. If you're left-handed, that's your right foot. Feel the ball with your throwing foot back so you're better able to make a quick, strong throw. Step forward, plant your throwing foot, and step with your other foot toward the target and throw. Be sure to follow through. Don't arc the ball up into the sky. Keep the throw low to the ground. It gets there faster that way. And if it's not right on target, the cutoff man will be able to relay it. As outfielders, one of your responsibilities is to back each other up. On balls hit to left or right field, the center fielder should run over behind the outfielder making the catch. That way, if the ball is misjudged, the center fielder will be in position to make the play, usually quicker than the other fielder who is scrambling to regain his bearings. On balls hit the center field, the other outfielders back up the center fielder. Another part of backing up is deciding who makes the catch if it's between fielders. A good rule of thumb is that the center fielder catches everything he can reach with the other fielders backing him up. For this to work, you have to communicate with each other. If the center fielder is going to make the catch, he has to yell, I've got it, I got twice it. loudly. I got it. On balls he can't reach, the other fielder must call for it. Be aggressive calling for fly balls, but if you hear the center fielder, back him up as he makes the catch. The same is true of pop-ups between the infield and outfield. The outfielder has priority. I got it. If you're I playing the outfield and can reach the ball, call for it at least twice. The infielder will get out of your way. You should back up all infield plays and always be aware of the game situation. You may go innings without ever touching the ball, but if you are backing up plays in the infield and staying aware of the count, how many outs there are, and where the play is, you won't be bored and you'll be ready to make the play when the ball does come to you. Follow along with the descriptions number by number and imitate the demonstrations so you are practicing as you watch. When you play infield, you have to have quick reflexes and be ready at all times. As the pitcher winds up, you have to be in your stance, the starting position that lets you field the ball most easily. Take your positions! Let's go! To get into my stance, I keep my legs about shoulder width apart, with my weight forward on the balls of my feet. I bend my knees and keep my throwing foot back slightly. I bend forward at the waist and dangle my arms in front of me with the glove out away from my body. This way I can move forward, backward, left or right and always be ready to feel the ball. The ball gets to you so quickly you have to be ready and alert. I say to myself, hit the ball to me, hit the ball to me. I also know where the base runners are, how many outs there are and what the score is. So I know where I'll throw the ball if a grounder is hit to me. On balls hit to the left or right, the most important thing for an infielder is a quick first step. 
When the ball is hit, I cross over and run back in an angle to where the ball is going. I keep my body and glove low to the ground. If I don't have time to get my body in front of the ball, I keep the glove low and let the ball roll into it. Even ground balls hit right at you are hard to handle if you don't do it right. Okay, Bobby, show them how. Let me describe what you did. You're in your stance, your legs shoulder width apart with knees bent. Your weight is forward on the balls of your feet. Your glove is down, open and facing the batter, ready to feel the ball. The ball comes right to you, so you step up, moving toward the ball. You put the back of your glove right on the ground in front of you and keep your backside down and your knees bent. Keep your eye on the ball. You want to watch the ball into your glove. Your throwing hand is open above the glove. Your glove foot is a little forward in front of your throwing foot as you feel the ball. Always keep your body square to the field and low, so if the ball takes a tough hop or bad bounce, it will stay in front of you and you can still field it. Notice how as the ball comes into his glove, he brings the glove straight back and absorbs the shock. He covers the ball with his throwing hand and brings the ball in his glove up to his waist, getting the proper grip on the ball. He's ready to throw. Once you get the ball, plant your throwing foot, take a crow hop toward the base you're throwing to, and make a straight throw by throwing overhand with backspin on the ball. Follow through and end up with your weight on your forward foot. An infielder must always be alert and know the game situation. There are bunt situations, double play situations, times the runner on third is less important than the runner on first, times you have to throw the guy out at the plate. Infielders have to talk and let each other know what each one is doing on every play. Next, we're going to cover the infield positions and demonstrate the responsibilities of each. Don't be content to know just your position. Learn them all. The more you know what your teammates are doing, the better you'll be able to do your own job. You'll get more chances to play, too. Gary, let's demonstrate how you feel to throw from an infielder. Okay. Okay, good. Now let's describe what you did. When the ball is hit on the ground to another infielder, I run to the base and put the heels of both my feet against the bag. I face the infielder who's going to throw the ball and make a target for him with my glove. Then when the throw comes, if it's to my right, I step with my right foot toward it. If it's to my left, I step with my left foot. Excellent. How hard was that to learn? It wasn't too bad. It takes some getting used to. At first, I was afraid I really had to hurry to make the play. But once you do it enough, you don't even have to think about it. As the first baseman, your main responsibility is to catch the ball. If an infielder makes a bad throw, remember, it's better to catch the ball and have the runner be safe at first than to have the ball go by you and the runner make it to second. On throws in the dirt, bring the ball back to you in your glove, like an infielder fielding a ground ball. Sometimes it looks like big league first basemen just stab or swipe at the low throw, and sometimes they do, but it's a bad habit to get into. Always try and ride the ball into your glove by bringing it back toward you. Also, get your body in front of the ball so that if it bounces over your glove, you still have a shot at blocking it with your body. In bunt situations, move up toward the plate when the ball is bunted on the first baseline, charge the ball and scoop it up with both hands. It's much easier to do that than it is to try and field it one-handed. On the sacrifice, my first play is to second base. I'm right-handed, so I pivot before I throw the ball. A left-hander can just pick the ball up and throw. If there is no play at second, the second baseman will be covering first base. Pick the ball up, then toss it to him firmly about chest high. On the ground ball hit to me, the pitcher will come over to cover first base. If I can beat the runner to the bag, I don't throw the ball. I just wave the pitcher away and make the play myself. If I can't beat the runner, I show the pitcher the ball, then toss it to him underhand, firmly about chest high. 
I lead him by a step or two so that he catches the ball as he steps on the base. On pop-ups, the first baseman should take those in front on the first base side of the diamond and those in foul ground. The technique is the same as for outfielders, but the first baseman should remember that on fly balls hit over his head, it's usually easier for the second baseman or the right fielder to make the catch. On balls hit to right and right center with runners on base, the first baseman is the cutoff man on plays to the plate. Position yourself just in front of the mound in a line between the plate and the outfielder fielding the ball. If the throw is offline, or if the catcher doesn't call for you to let the ball through, catch it and relay it to the plate. To make the quickest throw, when I catch a ball from the outfield, I turn my body so my throwing shoulder faces the outfielder and my glove shoulder faces the plate. As the ball comes in, I catch it in front of my throwing shoulder, crow hop, and release the ball very quickly. On throws from the outfield, I listen for the catcher. Sometimes he will call out for me to cut the ball off and relay it to second or third. As soon as I hear him calling for the play to go back to the infield, I position myself to make the easiest throw to that base before I catch the ball. Very good, Gary. Thanks, Coach. The second baseman covers the area from second base to about two-thirds of the way over to first base. If no one's on base, I play back behind the baseline, a quarter of the way to first base. If there's a runner on first base and less than two outs, I step up to the baseline and edge closer to the base. Both the second baseman and the shortstop cover second base on steals, while the second baseman covers first base on bunts when the first baseman is charging the ball. Good, Mark. Let's take a look at what happens to the second baseman on a bunt. He gets into his stance and positions himself halfway in, about even with the baseline. Although he has to cover second base on the steal, he tries to cheat a step or two toward first. On a bunt, he covers first. As the pitcher delivers the pitch, the batter squares around to bunt. Immediately, the second baseman runs over to first base. He stands with his foot on the ground, pressed against the inside part of the base, his shoulders square to the fielder throwing the ball. He makes a big target of his glove and is ready to take a throw from the first to third baseman, the pitcher or the catcher. If the throw goes to the shortstop covering second, the second baseman must stay ready for a relay from the shortstop going for a double play. On pop-ups, I cover the area around second base on the right side of the diamond from the pitcher's mound on out to right center field. The second baseman is also responsible for the area behind first base, all the way into foul territory. I go for pop-ups into the outfield, but the outfielder has priority on those. We'll discuss covering second base on steals a little later. Where do you play as cutoff man? On balls hit to right or right center on the relay man. As the ball goes into the outfield, I run out to short right or right center and line myself up between the fielder and the base he's throwing to. I hold my hands up high over my head so it's easier for him to see where he's throwing to, and I turn my body so my throwing shoulder points at the outfielder. Because I catch the ball in front of this shoulder, I can make a quicker throw. On balls to left and left center, I cover second base and call out to the shortstop where to make the play. Even after you've mastered a skill, go back to the tape and review it. Reviewing, like practicing, will keep you clear on what you have to do. The shortstop does the same thing as the second baseman, except on the left side of the diamond. Because the shortstop throws the first is longer, the shortstop should have the best arm. The shortstop plays behind the baseline, about a third to halfway to third base. He has to be able to get to a ground ball in the hole by third base, and to balls hit up the middle. Positioning and a quick first step are especially important for a shortstop. 
When there's a man on first and none out, the other team may sacrifice. On the sacrifice bunt, the shortstop almost always covers second base. As the pitcher winds up and delivers the ball, the batter will square around to bunt. When this happens, the shortstop should run over and cover second base. Whoever fields the bunt will try to make their play to second base to get the lead runner. The shortstop should make a big target with his glove and be ready to catch the ball, step on the bag for the force out, then throw to the second baseman covering first for the double play. On pop-ups, the shortstop catches anything hit from the pitcher's mound out into left and left center field. On fly balls to short left, go after them, but listen for an outfielder calling you off. If the outfielder calls, I got, I got it, it, run I off to it. your right, out of his way. The shortstop should also catch pop-ups behind third base all the way into foul territory. The shortstop is the relay man on throws to third base from center field and on throws to home and second base from left field. On outfield hits, the shortstop lines up directly between the outfielder with the ball and the base to which he is going to throw. He points his throwing shoulder toward the fielder, ready to make a quick throw after he catches the ball. He holds his hands high over his head so he is seen by the outfielder and makes a big target. He catches the ball in front of his throwing shoulder and is ready to make a quick relay to the base either the second or third baseman tells him. Just as with a second baseman, the relay is set up because two short throws are quicker and more accurate than one long throw. The majority of plays at second base are force plays. The rule of thumb is this. If the ball is hit to the right side of the infield, the shortstop covers second. If the ball is hit to the left side, the second baseman covers. All plays are easier if you're running to the ball rather than running away from it. There is a similar rule on stolen base attempts. When the runner on first tries to steal second, either the shortstop or the second baseman can cover the base. You have to decide before the play who is going to cover. A good way to decide is if the batter is right-handed, the second baseman covers on a steal attempt. The shortstop covers if the batter is left-handed. The one time you ignore this rule is when you suspect a sacrifice bunt play is on. Since the second baseman is running to cover first base, the shortstop should always cover second in sacrifice situations. When the steal is on, the fielder covering second should run as fast as he can to the base and straddle it, putting his right foot on the infield side of the bag, his left foot on the outfield side of the bag. Catch the ball and place your glove right in front of the base with the back side facing the runner. That way he can't kick the ball loose and will have to touch your glove to touch the base. Once the tag is made, you should pull your hand up to avoid injury, but don't move your glove to tag him or swipe at him. It's easier to miss the tag that way. The other thing to remember about covering second is to back each other up. If you're not the fielder making the play, you should still run behind the base and back up the throw. If the ball should be overthrown or bounce past the fielder covering, you'll be able to field the ball quickly and keep the runner from advancing to third. An infield is left to be small so the ball doesn't get lost in the pocket. When you play the infield, you have to break in your glove so that it can lie flat on the ground like this. One of the worst things you can do to your glove is to hold it like this, bending the fingers so they stick up. Each of the chapters is broken down into parts, marked by a small number in the corner of the screen. To learn any of the skills fully, watch the segment all the way through, then go back to the beginning and learn each part using the numbers to guide you. Third base is called the hot corner because the hardest hit balls come to the third baseman. See what I mean? I tried to field them cleanly, of course, but a lot of time, the best you can do is knock the ball down and try to keep it in front of you. If the ball is in front of you, you might have a play. I try to keep my body in front of the ball, and I keep it low to the ground in my stance when I'm making plays, so that if the ball does bounce up, my body will block it. I also keep my body square to the field, like this, so the ball doesn't bounce off to the side. 
I have a lot of responsibility in bunch situations. I play up in front of the bag when a sacrifice bunt is likely. That's when there's a runner on first and nobody out. I keep my way forward, as always, on the balls of my feet. I'm ready to charge when the batter squares around to bunt. If the bun is down the third baseline and the ball has stopped rolling, I pick it up barehanded in the proper grip for throwing. If the ball is still rolling, I feel it in my glove, then take it out in the proper throwing grip. On ground balls, the third baseman should always throw with an overhand motion and backspin. But on a lot of bunts and slow rolling grounders, you won't have time to set for an overhand throw. In those situations, sidearm is okay. I spend a lot of time practicing throwing sidearm to first base. The sidearm throw will tail in, so I throw to the outfield side of first base. If the pitcher, first baseman, or catcher fields the bunt, I have to get back as quickly as I can to third base, because no one is covering there. On fly balls, I catch any pop-ups that are in toward the catcher from third base in both fair and foul territory. I let the shortstop get any balls that go behind me, so I don't ever turn my back on the plate. On fouls near the fence, I run quickly to the fence and make sure I know where it is, then step back toward the field to make the catch. On tag plays at third base, I straddle the bag with my left foot on the left field side and my right foot down the third base line. I catch the throw and put my glove right in front of the bag so that the runner has to slide into it. And I show the runner the back of my glove so he can't kick the ball loose. That's about it. The catcher has the most thankless job on a baseball team. He is the field manager, responsible for making sure that all the fielders are in position, that the pitcher throws the right pitch, and that the whole team is alert and ready to play. The catcher Coach, must... let me explain. Go ahead, Colin. The catcher has to take charge of the team. I tell everyone how many outs there are, where they should play, and sometimes what they should do. My job is to keep the team involved in the game. I do that by yelling, by raising my hand, signaling how many outs there are, anything it takes to make sure all nine of us are on our toes and playing as a team. The thing a catcher is best known for is being the backstop. So let's start there. When I get into the catcher's box, I position myself about one arm's length from the batter. I can just barely touch him with my glove. I am crouching, and I give my signs with my throwing hand against the inside of my thigh. We don't throw curveballs, so I signal for either a fastball or changeup with one or two fingers, and I shield the sign from the third base coach with my glove. Then I get into my stance to give the pitcher a target. I raise myself so I'm balanced on the balls of my feet and I crouch. My feet are spread just a little wider than my shoulders. With my throwing foot a couple inches behind the other one, the toe points is slightly toward first base. I keep my elbows outside my knees. I then raise my glove and give a target for the pitcher. I hold the glove sideways as if I'm going to shake the pitcher's hand. The reason for this is if the ball is above my knees, I'm going to catch it with my fingers pointing up. If it's below my knees, I want my fingers pointing down. With my hands sideways, I only have to move it halfway around to catch the ball, no matter where it is. I make sure the target is in the strike zone, since I want the pitcher to throw the ball right to the glove. If no one's on base, I put my throwing hand behind my back or leg, whichever is more comfortable. This protects it from being hit with a foul tip. If there's a runner on base, I keep my throwing hand right behind the glove so I can throw the ball quickly. As the ball comes to the glove, I absorb the shock by bringing my hands back toward my body and then up to the throwing position. What about interference? When you stab at the ball by moving your glove toward the ball, it's harder to catch and the bat may hit your glove, which is interference and the batter gets to go to first. Once I've caught the ball, if there's anyone on base, I'm going to have to throw it quickly. Getting a quick release is more important than how strong your arm is. I work hard at getting the throw off fast. I shuffle to the side the pitch comes in on, always trying to stay right in front of the ball. I catch it by bringing my glove back toward my body to absorb the shock, put my hand over the ball and bring the glove and ball into throwing position as I stand up and step toward the base I'm throwing to. I let go of the ball with an overhand motion and backspin. I'm careful not to step on home plate as I make the throw, because I might slip on the base and hurt myself, or the throw will go high. I either step over the base or around it. What if the pitch is in the dirt? I hate it when the pitch is in the dirt, but blocking those pitches is probably the most important thing I do. 
When a pitch is in the dirt, I can't let it get past me if there's a runner on base. What I do is I drop to my knees, put my glove between my legs so there isn't any opening, and drop my chin to my chest so the ball doesn't hit my throat. On balls in the dirt, I never even try to catch the ball. I keep my body straight so it bounces off me out in front of me on the field. On bounce pitches to my left or right, I try to do the same things, but I first slide my body in front of the ball. It's scary to have the ball bounce off your body, but that's why the catcher wears so much protective equipment. Because if he uses it, it keeps him from getting hurt. Don't ever turn your head away from the ball. If you can't see it, you won't catch it. One thing that took a lot of practice was keeping myself from blinking as I caught the ball. I worked hard at it because if you close your eyes, you're taking your eyes off the ball and you'll have a hard time catching it. Another hard play is catching pop-ups. The thing to remember about pop-ups is that most of the time, a right-handed batter will pop up to your right, a left-handed batter to your left. When the ball is popped up, I immediately take the mask off and locate the ball. Once I found it, I throw the mask away in the other direction, so I can't possibly step on it, and I move over to where the ball is going to come down. Pops curve back toward the field, so it's easiest if I keep my back to the infield and let the ball come back to me. If the ball is near the fence, I first run to the fence and make sure I know where it is. Then I move away from it to the ball. You're doing a great job, Colin. Of course, what'd you expect? Okay, okay, what about fielding bunts? The catcher should field all bunts that he can reach because he has the easiest throw to any base. When the ball is bunted, I spring out from behind the plate and run to the ball as quickly as I can. If another fielder and I are going to reach the ball at the same time, I call him off and field the ball with both hands, get set and make an overhand throw. If the bun is on the first baseline, I step toward the pitcher's mound before I throw to the second base side of first, so I don't hit the runner. And another thing, with the man only on first, if the third baseman feels the bun, I run down and cover third base. That's it, coach, isn't it? That's it, Colin. Woo! Even after you've mastered a skill, go back to the tape and review it. Reviewing, like practicing, will keep you clear on what you have to do. Pitching is a complicated skill, made harder because the pitcher must also play the field like an infielder. It takes practice, but the pitcher who fields the ball well helps himself and his team. Pitchers field bunts and grounders just like other infielders. After you throw the ball, you should end up with your body down. Your weight on the balls of your feet and your glove forward and open, ready to field the ball if it's hit back to the box. One difference, when the pitcher fields a ground ball, he should step down off the mound before he makes the throw to first or any base. You have time to do this, and by being on the same level as the first baseman, you'll be less likely to throw the ball over his head. Make a firm overhand toss, too. Don't lob the ball. Pitchers also field bunts like the other infielders. However, a left-handed pitcher fielding a bunt must circle behind the ball. Plant his left foot on the third base side and crow hop to make the throw to either first or second. A right-hander can simply pick the ball up and throw it. One of the pitcher's most important responsibilities is covering first base on ground balls to the first baseman. On a ground ball hit to the first baseman, I run over to cover first base as quickly as I can. I don't run right at the base, though. I run to the first baseline about 10 feet before the bag. Then I run up the line toward the base. The first baseman will throw the ball underhand toward my chest just as I reach the bag. Once I step on the base, I turn back onto the field. If I run straight up the line or over into foul territory, I might collide with the base runner and hurt myself or him. Another thing the pitcher has to do if there's a runner on base is cover home plate on a wild pitch or pass ball. As soon as I see the catcher doesn't catch the ball, I run to the plate. Even if the runner is on first, if I'm at the plate, I can act as a relay man on any throws. One last thing. The pitcher backs up bases on throws from the outfield. To back up the base where the throw is going to go, stand about 30 to 40 feet behind it, and you'll be in position to field an overthrow. If you can't tell if the play will be to the plate or third base, set up between them and foul ground and wait to see how the play develops. A good fielding pitcher helps his team prevent runs, and that's the name of good defense, preventing runs. Justin, why don't you warm up so you'll be ready for the pitching demonstration? Sure, coach. That's the fun part.
How many pitches is that, Justin? 25. Well, that should be plenty. Do you feel loose? Yeah, real strong. Good. Why do major leaguers take so long to warm up? Well, it's the same principles and other things, Justin. The older you get, the tighter, less elastic your ligaments get. So it takes longer to get loose. The thing for you to remember is that young arms loosen up quickly, but they also get tired easily. Once your muscles are loose, every throw you make in warm-ups is one less you'll be able to make in the game. 20 to 30 tosses should be plenty to get you loose. Now we're going to demonstrate the proper pitching form. I think it will be easiest if I talk you through the steps. The first thing is the set position. Put the front half of your pitching foot, if you're a right-hander, your right foot, if you're a left-hander, it's your left foot, with the front part of your shoe on the rubber. Good. Now put the ball behind your right leg, or left leg if you're left-handed, and hold the ball in the proper throwing grip, fingers a little apart across the wide seams. Okay, get comfortable. Your knees are bent slightly. Your body is square to home plate. Fine. In Little League, you'll be taking signs for a fastball and changeup. The curveball is hard on your arm, and there's no reason to risk getting hurt when you're so young. Take the sign and wait for the catcher to set up. Keep your eye on the target, then take your rocker step. Step backwards straight toward second base and shift your weight to your non-pitching foot. At the same time, bring your hands forward so the ball and your glove meet at the top of your forehead or just over your head. Bury the ball in your glove and show the batter only the back of your glove. Now take the pivot step. Move your pitching foot so that it points to third base if you're right-handed or first base if you're left-handed. Rest it just at the front of the rubber so you will be able to push off the front part of the rubber. Remember, always keep your foot touching the rubber. If you lift it off, it's a balk. Now turn your hip and shoulder on your non-pitching side so that they point toward home plate. Also bend your back knee slightly and bring your hands down and break them over your knee. Bring the hand holding the ball out of the glove and bring it behind your hip. Now step toward the plate and drive your front shoulder forward. Bring your elbow on your pitching arm up higher than your shoulder. Push off the rubber with your pitching leg bent at the knee and land on the ball of your non-pitching foot with your toes pointed toward home plate. Make your arm circle your shoulder and release the ball with a strong wrist snap and follow through. In following through, bring your pitching hand across to the opposite knee and step off the rubber toward home plate. You will now stand facing the batter and in perfect position to feel the ball. Pitching is the most complex of baseball skills. Proper technique is essential if you're going to avoid arm injuries. So work hard on perfecting the windup and the leg drive forward and always follow through. You can practice the motion without throwing the ball and should. Most sore arms come from throwing too much, so practice a lot. But throw only every other day and be careful not to overdo it. And if your arm tightens up, feels sore or tired, swells up or is tender, tell your coach and rest your arm. Being competitive includes knowing when you can hurt yourself and your teammates by pitching when you shouldn't. That's it, guys. We've gone through all the basic skills, and I'm proud of you for working so hard at making this tape. I think it will pay off for beginning players in a big way, and already it's helped us. Remember, if we all help one another and play like a team, we can't lose. We may or may not win all our games. Only one team can win. We can guarantee we'll be winners by caring for each other and doing our best. I trust in God. I love my country and I respect its laws. I will play fair and strive to win. But win or lose, I will always do my best. Oh, come on, throw some strikes. You know, I think that bat's too heavy. You're dropping it down when you swing. It feels all right. Try choking up a little. Do you really think we can make it to the World Series? I don't know. There are so many good teams to beat. But I think we're good enough. Now throw the bat at the ball while you stride. I'll throw it right down the middle. That's better. Just keep on practicing. Hey, that felt great. Even if we don't make it, I'll still be glad I spent my summer playing baseball. Me too. Let's go get that come ball. Come on, Rusty, let's go get the ball. Come on, come on, guy, come on. Let's go. Come on, Rusty, let's go get that ball. Baseball, Klazuski, Campanella, talking baseball. The man and Bobby Fella, the scooter, the barber, and the nuke. Let's go, come on. They knew a 
Omaha from Boston to Dubuque, especially with Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Mickey and the Duke. Come on. 